My name is Mark Edwards. I'm a senior science advisor with the OCS and your host for today. On behalf of the entire OCS team, welcome to our science seminar series and the first of our seminars for 2023. So today I'm happy to offer the land acknowledgement. Uh, I respectfully acknowledge that our OCS offices are located on the traditional lands and gathering place for tree six and seven, region three and four of the Métis Nations of Alberta. These lands are the home of diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities today. In keeping with the traditions of gathering, these science seminars provide an opportunity for us to get together, to exchange knowledge on interesting science happening across Alberta in an open learning and sharing environment. The hope is that through our dialogue today, we are all able to improve our awareness and understanding and put this knowledge into practice to support evidence-informed decision-making wherever that occurs. Today, we have the honor of welcoming Wes Olson. Wes is a bison management consultant and author. He worked for Parks Canada as a national park warden for 32 years in Banff, Waterton, Elk Island, Prince Albert, and Grassland National Park. Uh, the majority of his time was spent working as part of a team responsible for the management of plains and wood bison population and the rematriation of both subspecies into areas of their former historic range. This long history with the most spectacular natural areas that Canada has to offer has provided Wes with a wealth of artistic inspiration that is reflected in the accuracy and detail of his works of art. Wes has the unique ability to combine his extensive scientific knowledge about bison with his talents using graphite, watercolor, oil painting, and mixed medium artwork to capture the buffalo and other wildlife in their natural environments. Wes has been a keynote speaker at conferences, seminars, and naturalist groups across Canada and the United States and continues to give presentations about bison and their ecosystem roles they play to any audience curious about bison. So over to you, Wes. Well, thank you very much for the, the introduction, Mark, uh, and welcome everybody. It's a, a treat to present to the group. Uh, so I'm gonna dive right into it, given that we started a little late. Um, the talk is titled The Ecological Buffalo. And I intentionally selected the word buffalo over bison as my small way of reconciliation to First Nations, uh, because they speak to buffalo, uh, not so much to bison. Uh, so we'll talk about the keystone role of um, bison or, or buffalo on the northern mixed grass prairie. Uh, this is my wife, the photographer for all of the slides that follow. And I always have to give her um, her a credit for the work that she does because without it, um, the presentations wouldn't be anywhere near as interesting to look at. So we'll talk about the historical distribution of North American plains and wood bison, how they affected the ecosystems that they lived in, who they shared those landscapes with, and some examples of the species that were directly or indirectly influenced by bison. This is a, a young plains bison bull crossing the Lamar River Valley in Yellowstone National Park. So probably a lot of you have seen this graphic. It was produced by Joel Allen in 1876, showing the contract contraction of the historic Plains Bison Range, uh, graded by color as, as the population shrank in, in time, uh, to eventually reaching a point in 1885 where in all of North America, there were 23 wild tree ranging bison uh, hiding in the upper uh, reaches of the Pelican River Valley in Yellowstone. And about the same time, another 250 uh, wood bison living in what's now Wood Buffalo National Park and, and the area around it. And this is a complex map you don't have to pay much attention to other than recognizing its complexity. The, these people identified 116 ecoregions in, in North America. I went through each of them um, and figured out that there's approximately 46 ecoregions historically occupied by plains bison. Some examples of these were, uh, of course, Wood Buffalo National Park. There's some nice young wood bison and bulls. Um, in 1963, Parks Canada, uh, Sioux Wood Buffalo National Park established the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary uh, south of Yellowknife. There's an aged bull um, from Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary. They were in the 
Antelope Island State Park, very arid, dry landscape. Um, the population there is managed at around 500. It's a very dry, arid landscape. There. They made it into Caprock Canyons, um, part of the uh, Texas Panhandle, where Charles Goodnight and his, in particular his wife uh, made efforts to capture and salvage the last southern plains bison. They made it over into the northern uh, Florida Panhandle and the Oak Savannas there. And of course, up the tall grass prairie, which extends along the, the eastern side of the Great Plains up into southern Manitoba, called the tall grass prairie because of um, big blue stem, which will exceed two meters in height. A lot of people recognize that there were vast numbers of bison, but um, most people forget that there was upwards of 32 million elk on the landscape at the same time, and perhaps another 36 million uh, pronghorns, which are pretty high ungulate density. Plains bison made it down the Rocky Mountain chain to Grand Tetons and all the way up into the Aspen Parkland here in Elk Island National Park, where my wife and I live beside, uh, and in Prince Albert National Park. But the bulk of the talk is going to focus on the northern mixed grass prairie uh, in the region around Grasslands National Park. Uh, for those of you who haven't been there, um, this can, can you see my uh, mouse on the screen? Mark? Uh, no. Okay, uh, this is the northern mixed grass prairie, uh, separate from or at the very northern end of the Great, uh, Great Plains. And there's a red circle uh, just across the Canada US border. That's the Cypress Hills. And draining out of the Cypress Hills, moving eastward uh, into the Missouri and subsequently into the Mississippi drainages, is the Frenchman River Valley. Uh, it's a very complex ecosystem uh, inside the park. And for quite a range of different habitat types and slopes and aspects, which created an environment that was perfectly suited to having uh, plains bison on it. And they impact ecosystems in a variety of ways. Now here's a pair of brown-headed cowbirds, a male and a female, taking a rest on this young bull's forehead. But they influence the, the ecosystems they live in, in in three principal ways. And the first is through their direct disturbance on the landscape starting from something as simple as urine deposition on the grasses uh, to winter trails that they punched through the, the winter snowpack. And out there on the Great Plains uh, with high winds, snow piles up on the lee slopes and without large hoofed mammals like bison on the landscape, um, there's no other animal out there that can create and then maintain trails through that deep snow. And bison manure obviously is a pretty significant impact on the landscape. Now, this one was used by a robin as a listening post while she hunted for prey around it. Bison wallows are a pretty fascinating place. Um, for Joanna and I, when we're out in a bison refuge, we think of these as the prairie guest book where all other visitors stop and, and leave their signatures behind. We've identified dozens of different species just from their footprints. Patch grazing is one of the most important uh, physical disturbances. And it's one of the leading reasons why people are still trying to establish bison uh, back on areas of the former historic range. And I'll get into that in more detail. And pugging is just a fancy word for footprints, but it's a pretty important landscape disturbance. So much so that back in the early 1990s, we were approached by um, Sergei Zimov, a biologist from Russia, who collaborated with Mimi Chapin uh, from Alaska to establish Pleistocene National Park uh, in central Siberia, north central. Uh, and it was his theory that it was the presence of large hoofed mammals like bison on the landscape with the scarification action of their grazing and their, and their footprints um, that can reverse um, the permafrost environment and put it back into a dry steppe grassland environment because the seed bank that's there from the end of the Pleistocene is still viable. And Parks Canada then over many years uh, contributed 120 wood bison to that project and they've demonstrated that just having bison back on the landscape can in fact reinvigorate the seeds uh, from those uh, ancient footprints. And of course urine on the landscape is a huge flush of nutrients uh, that benefit the bison through their grazing behavior. There was a nice study done by Campbell et al in 1994 showing that it was the removal of uh, bison grazing at the end of the 1880s 
and the removal of First Nations burning that allowed the Aspen Parkland to expand both southwards and westwards uh, towards the Rocky Mountain chain. Uh, and that had big consequences for almost everything that, that lived in or near the Aspen Parkland. It's a great shot of bison wallowing. Some of the direct disturbances are, of course, nobody thinks of external parasites as being very charismatic, uh, but there are native species as our internal parasites. Uh, this was a boar grizzly that had killed a bison cow in Yellowstone. Uh, he ate a good chunk of her, buried her, and then within the next 24 hours, a sow with three yearling cubs uh, came along and they completely cleaned it up. And bison carcasses, of course, were a huge impact on the North American plains. And with an average annual mortality rate of just 3%, uh, that would have represented around 900,000 carcasses, uh, fresh carcasses on the landscape every single year. Here's an example of those carcasses benefiting a species, uh, the sexton beetle, uh, named the sexton beetle because uh, just like the sexton in a church, uh, they do a good job of burying things. And this one is carrying a load of phoretic mites. Uh, they can't travel to a carcass on their own, so we hitchhike a ride on the back of these guys um, and then arrive at a bison carcass and within a very short time uh, begin their reproductive cycles. This was a bison that had been killed by another bison during the breeding season in Elk Island. Park staff put out some trail cameras and identified upwards of 18 different coyotes that had visited that carcass along with countless birds, uh, insects, tremendous pulse of nutrients into that ecosystem. Some of the more indirect relationships that relate to facilitative grazing. Of course, facilitative grazing is simply bison creating a landscape that facilitates the survival of other herbivores. Uh, everything from white-tailed deer to uh, the nuttles or cotton, uh, mountain cottontail, uh, white-tailed mule deer, pronghorns, uh, black-tailed prairie dogs, and white-tailed jackrabbits. Virtually every herbivore will benefit from having bison on that landscape. And some of the broader food web relationships in grasslands. This goes back quite a few years and identified 77 different species of grasshoppers you know, just within the park. Uh, and that's a huge, uh, hugely diverse diet for all the microteens that are out there, uh, including swift fox, red fox, and, and coyotes. This was from a the squirrel nest, is from a, a paper from the Yukon where Tom Young and his colleagues discovered five different uh, squirrel nests within a, a, a radius of an adult wood bison bull that had died during the late spring. And they scavenged that, that carcass for air and built nests out of it. And that, of course, increases the survival of uh, squirrel babies, which have then turn feeds the, the predators that, that like to eat them. This is a, a bison footprint uh, in grasslands and driven deep into the bentonite clay, um, a horned lark, uh, found it, wove her nest in the bottom of it entirely out of shed bison hair that she picked up off the prairie, laid three eggs in there, and then she, it was parasitized by a brown headed cowbird female who laid two of her eggs on top. And it's a completely functioning ecosystem just within that one footprint. And shed bison hair is a very important uh, part of this landscape now. Um, it's the second warmest fiber in all of North American native ungulates, next only to the muskox and kibiot. So it's some really broad uh, ecosystem benefits, and it's all influenced through bison grazing. And in particular, it all starts with bison smog. And this is a really fascinating uh, thing for me. I've been intrigued by this for quite some time. Bison snot is the microbiome that drives this entire ecosystem. And without it, these guys couldn't survive out there. As bison are grazing across the landscape, their noses are constantly embedded in the vegetation that is growing there. Um, and as they're grazing, they're inhaling. They have a massive set of lungs, largest trachea of any North American land mammal. So they're inhaling all of this gunk that gets hung up in their nasal vestibules. Periodically, and you've seen this with cattle probably or other uh, ungulates with a rumen, they'll stop and they'll have to clean that nasal vestibule out. And when they do that, they're ingesting bacteria, fungi, and microbes um, that have been hung up in the nasal vestibules. All of that, of course, then 
and flows through the digestive system and, and into the rumen. And once it's in the rumen, there's a completely functioning ecosystem with predators and prey uh, inside that rumen. Bison have the largest rumen, of course, of all North American uh, mammals. Um, in some cases, it can be up to 45 gallons in, in volume. I haven't figured what that is in liters, um, but they've got a very complex microbiome. And the, the rumen functions almost exactly like your backyard composter, where food scraps go in, they sit there, you, you churn and, and mix that, um, that composter, and it helps to break it down. In a bison, the same thing happens. As they ingest the fungi that uh, works on that vegetation, it passes into the rumen, and it's there to, uh, to break down the starch, the bacteria can digest it. The bacteria, in turn, break down the sugars and protein and, and fiber in the vegetation. And then the bacteria and, and fungi are hunted by protozoa. There's literally millions of protozoa within the rumen of one bison. Um, and this whole functioning ecosystem is designed to break down cellulose in the forage that these bison are consuming. I have a, an expanded version of this in a slide of a protozoa, and I've always equated them to be the, the equivalent to blue whales swimming through the ocean, you know, hunting millions of krill or you know, smaller animals that swim through the ocean. You know, protozoa do the same thing within the rumen. And of course, not all of that is digested. Uh, some of it actually, the bacteria, fungi, and protozoa uh, pass through the digestive system and into the, excreted into the dung. There's some studies have shown that up to a quarter of the protein that a bison gets through his daily diet is the digestion of uh, microbes, not just the vegetation. Hugely important. And of course, then it ends, ends up on the landscape in a very photogenic bison patty like this one. Um, and within that bison patty is another completely functioning ecosystem. Uh, it starts out with the bacteria that and fungi and protozoa that the bison ingested. They're still viable, living uh, within that dung pad. But within a, just a few minutes, uh, there's a whole host of other species and foraging guilds begin to appear on, the, on that bison pad. And they, in turn, are hunted by the predators that arrive shortly after the dung pad has been colonized by these invertebrate species. Incredibly complex. Uh, there's some work that shows that one bison patty can host up to 100 different insect species over its lifespan on the, on the prairie, and up to a thousand different insects uh, individuals will be produced from one buffalo patty. Dung beetles, of course, were historically incredibly important for the uh, nutrient recycling on the Great Plains. Um, as the bison were extirpated by the mid to late 1880s, vast tracts of North America were depopulated of bison. And many of these dung beetles could only exist on a dung pat uh, versus a, like a servant pellet. So we suspect that there is a massive population crash of, of dung beetles across the Great Plains as the bison were extirpated. This guy is a Photius vimitarius. Uh, he's an import from Europe. Some suspicion is that he arrived uh, in North America with a boatload of cattle from England in the late 1890s in, in Harbor, Boston, and then quickly spread westwards and is now the most one of the most dominant dung beetles in North America. They don't, of course, eat the dung. They, hunt, they eat the you know, microbes that are swimming around within that dung pad. Historically, during the summer months, there's lots of records of you know, fresh dung pads vanishing completely from the landscape uh, due to the burrowing and uh, ecosystem dispersal uh, done by dung beetles. There are three different functional guilds of dung beetles, uh, fast burying, uh, the ones that tunnel down into the below the soil surface. There's two guilds of those, fast burying and slow burying. As the dung beetles occupy or find a fresh dung pad, uh, they'll tunnel down through the dung pad, the females burrow down, depending on the soil type, up to a meter below ground. And she'll take the fast burying ones, typically will create brood chambers down here, where she will bring one brood ball, lay one egg in it, and then that brood ball acts as a nutrient resource for that, that one egg. And there's the dwellers, that's what the last one was, the red one, the Photos They do their complete reproductive 
the life cycle within the dung pad itself. And then there's a the classic roller storm we always see from Africa or various places of dung beetles rolling a brood ball away from the dung pad. Dung beetles are the only insect on the planet, an invertebrate on the planet, that uses celestial navigation uh, during its reproductive cycle. If you're ever out on a, a northern mixed grass prairie or short grass prairie where there are healthy populations of dung beetles and bison, uh, if you're there on a full moon night, you'll see them the brood balls all rolling towards the full moon. And on a night when there isn't a full moon, uh, they use the Milky Way to navigate as a means of dispersing their dung uh, and eggs away from the, the brood pad or the, the buffalo pad. Then of course, as these insects uh, take their brood balls away from the dung pad, species like the long-billed curlew or Macomb's longspur uh, come along and, and hunt them. As I mentioned, one manure pot can host up to 100 individuals and 1,000 um, individual insects and a quarter of their body mass in insects every year. So that made me wonder what it was like when there were 30 million bison roaming the Great Plains. And I, I went back to William Hornaday's work where he estimated the 30 million plains bison and the population crash over time from 1861 to the late 1880s. And based on a, a quarter of the biomass of 30 million bison at this point, um, they, were, they, they were responsible for the creation of up to 300 billion insects every single day, um, just from the, the manure that they produced. It must have been devastating to all of the insectivorous guilds across North America by 1890, because there was none of that left. We have numerous uh, observations of Blacktail prairie dogs in Grasslands National Park foraging early in the spring on winter bison patties. You'd see these guys sitting up on top of that dung pat and then chewing rhythmically around the outside of it, ingesting the undigested material that's in here. And there's a patch of bison shed here, uh, there as well. And lots of observations of these guys taking bison here down into their natal dens as a way of um, increasing the survival of their pups. Bison affect grasslands communities in a, in a variety of ways, but it almost always starts uh, with new populations in the winter months. Most populations are established towards late spring, and as bison breeze across that landscape, they're cratering through the snowpack to get at the vegetation that's hidden below. And in the spring, this is what that looks like. This is a patch of uh, heavily grazed uh, by bison uh, in, within a, a much larger expanse of ungrazed grass. And when the spring growth begins, you know, that will look like this. This is that same patch. And this is what drove bison ecology across North America for thousands of years, is the, the presence of these grazed grazing lawns and grazing patches. Because it's just like our lawn. It's, it's, we go out there on Monday and mow our backyard lawn. By Wednesday, we need to cut it again. And it's that succulent, almost instant, instantly digestible uh, forage that the bison seek, as do what every other herbivore you know, that's out there with them. And typically, these grazed patches will continue to produce new growth until about, say, the middle of August. The typical place bison breeding season is from the middle of July to the middle of August. And that's when those massive congregations of tens of thousands of bison in one place were observed. And within that group, they were all seeking out and regrazing uh, these grazing patches. The, towards the middle of August on the Great Plains, the grass is cured and no longer produce uh, fresh growth. And at that point, the massive rutting aggregations would disperse, they'd break up, um, and then begin to roam much faster distances, uh, grazing the ungrazed grasses. And then from there, that's what it looks like. This is a, a aerial photograph from Grasslands National Park. And you can see the complexity of the vegetation mosaic here. And, and all of that is a direct response to having bison in Grasslands National Park. We brought this herd to the park in uh, late winter of 2005. They were held in confinement uh, in a holding pen until May of 2006. There were 71 individuals at that time, uh, 30 male and 30 female uh, year calves when they were brought there, and another 11 female uh, yearlings. 
and the park has exceeded 500 now on several occasions. And that's sort of the upper limit to the population. Uh, they reduce the herd every two years. Some examples of the interspecies relationships that bison have. Uh, here's a couple of classic uh, non-native um, relationships. The European starlings, of course, are not native to North America, and neither is crested wheatgrass, uh, which these bison are, are better within. Crested wheatgrass was brought into North America during the 1930s as a soil stabilizing plant. It originated in Siberia, and it's excellent at stabilizing drifting soils, but it's also very invasive. And it can begin to encroach and, and take over native prairie, such as the case in grasslands. And the park is an excellent program of converting these crested wheatgrass stands back into native prairie. To help folks understand what happened in grasslands, I put together these drawings. Grassland was the first ranch land was acquired in 1987 when Walt Larson decided that he wanted to retire from the ranching industry and he sold it to Parks Canada. At that time, it was a pretty dynamic landscape. It had been grazed by cattle since the early 1900s. And Parks at the time decided that as soon as a rancher sold to them, they would immediately remove the cattle from the landscape, take down all the internal fences, and leave it vacant, you know, with the exception of um, species like white tail or mule deer and pronghorns that, that occupy the landscape. And within a very short time, it became a, a diverse grassland, one dominated by grasses. It, there aren't very many uh, forbs or flowering plants left on the landscape after several years of no cattle grazing. We put bison back on that landscape and very quickly they start to form those grazing patches that I mentioned. And as that occurs over time, we began to see an increase in, in forbs. The one on the very left is winter fat. It's called winter fat because literally cattle would gain fat on it right throughout the winter. Incredibly high protein levels when everything else was, was very low. So beginnings of a change uh, for forbs and with thick taproot plants began to appear. Um, and that benefited everything from metals, cotton tail to well, every other herbivore in the landscape. And over time we began to notice not just an above ground change in the floristic diversity, um, but also a change in the subterranean uh, root diversity. Grassland Grasses, of course, are supremely adapted to suck moisture out of the soil from incredible depths. Um, but they can't survive, can't maintain that deep root system under extensive grazing in these grazing patches. And that gives flowering plants and forbs a chance to uh, recover and, and move back in again. And over time, the landscape switched back to an incredibly diverse mixture of plants and animals. Um, insects, flowers, you name it, a very complex and very dynamic ecosystem, but with also a very dynamic root system below ground. And that, I, there's a series of slides that I took out to shorten the talk, uh, but the, those roots below ground are incredibly important for pocket gophers, northern pocket gophers. And they, of course, live in the soil, just below the soil surface. There's one study that showed that it requires 3,500 times as much energy to travel one meter underground as it does one meter above ground. And pocket gophers can't survive on grass roots. They need those thick, nutritious uh, tap roots you know, that the flowers and flowering plants provide. And then those northern pocket gopher burrows provide an incredible array of habitats for literally dozens of different you know, insects, mammals, and reptiles, and uh, rename it. Uh, Snakes, for example, will use them. It's incredibly important to get that low ground structure back on the landscape. The introduction of shed hair to the ecosystem is very important, especially for grassland songbirds, uh, most rapidly declining guild of birds in North America. Uh, there's been some work done out of Oklahoma State by Brian Kopich, where he, he put um, quail eggs in nests lined with bison hair in nests that were naturally created without bison hair. And he found upwards of a 60% increase in chick survival just from the presence of bison hair because it provides uh, olfactory masking that hides the smell of the nest from the inquisitive noses of passing predators. Uh, it's incredibly water repellent fiber and of course very warm. So those features aid in the survival of 
grassland songbirds or songbirds generally. Did a lot of work looking at uh, how many species benefit. This is a very short list. There's literally dozens that uh, have been documented using it, uh, bison hair in their nests. And Joanne, my wife, was out one day in grasslands and saw this Richardson ground squirrel in an area of the park that the bison had only just recently discovered in the very southeastern corner, southwestern corner. Uh, it was occupied in this area by one bull in particular. And she saw this ground squirrel going back and forth to a wallow that was about 20 meters away, making repeated trips, bringing bison hair that he'd shed down into her natal den. Uh, and that was a pretty big risk for this little mammal. There's lots of avian predators there, badgers and coyotes and you know, red fox, all of which would love to make a meal out of her. Um, but she risked that to bring that fiber down into her nest. The instinctive knowledge of mammals like this to benefit from bison here always amazes me. There hadn't been a bison on that landscape for about 150 years, and yet she retained the knowledge that this was a valuable fiber. Bison walls, of course, are a pretty fascinating place to visit. I did a study in grasslands, or pardon me, in Elk Island National Park, just a, a little hobby thing, where I compared wallow density for plains and on the north side of Highway 16 and wood bison on the south side in identical habitats. In plains bison wallowed, the density of bison wallows on the landscape was approximately five per hectare. And across the highway with the wood bison, it was 0 0.01 wallows per hectare, almost non-existent in comparison. And we think that that's because uh, of behavior of the plains bison. Uh, they're much more aggressive to each other and they use wallows as a way to display that aggression. Uh, wood bison are nowhere near as aggressive to each other. Plains bison also have a negative, a naked uh, hips and hair on, no hair on the rib cage and hips. Uh, which needs protection from biting insects uh, to get that through wallowing. But they in turn, these wallows provided an incredible important habitat for a bunch of different species. This is a scene in Grasslands National Park again of a couple wallows that are, are new and being maintained by bison. And in the background, all of these other depressions are ancient bison wallows uh, that existed prior to the 1880s. Uh, they're still there, but they don't longer hold water because the vegetation in that wallow uh, sucks it up fairly quickly. So it's only the earthen wallows that hold and support uh, those vernal wetlands early in the spring. And that's incredibly important for this guy, this spade for the toad. They have the fastest metamorphosis of, of any uh, toad or, or frog on, in North America. They'll arrive, the female will arrive at, at the wallow and you know, lay her eggs in there. And within just a couple of days, the tadpoles hatch. Those tadpoles have eyes that face sideways, uh, typical of any prey species. As the water, and they feed on the algae and, and pond vegetation that's in there, as the water depth drops and becomes warmer, the skull morphology of the tadpole changes and the eyes begin to shift and face forward, uh, typical of a, a predator. And they in turn switch their diet from aquatic vegetation to uh, smaller tadpoles and insects that inhabit that the vernal wetland with them. And in a matter of 10 days from the arrival of the female to the pond, out hops a fully morphed adult in a 10 day period. There were literally tens of millions of bison wallows across North America, and all of them providing ecosystem services like that. And by the end of the 1880s, there were none left. And so again, huge population crashes of species like the spade food toad, the Canadian toad, um, all the frogs that would have lived out there historically. Here in, in the Aspen Parkland, um, this is the scene, um, the typical spring scene in the park, where bison will graze those nearly greening up patches uh, on the south facing slopes. It's a complex uh, mosaic of vegetation types and low lying wetlands, ponds. Uh, and typically, what happens is bison will graze those green patches out in the middle and then move back to the forest edge to, to chew their cud, ruminate, um, and then they'll stand up and, and leave a buffalo patty on close to the forest edge. There's a much higher, higher density of buffalo patties adjacent to the forest edge than there is out in the middle of the meadow system. 
I was in the park one day back in the, it was in the early 90s, and I, I saw this woman crawling around on her hands and knees in, in the middle of one of these meadows, very intently staring at the ground as she crawled along. I watched her for a while, and then I, I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to go over and ask her what she was up to. And turns out she was a young woman from Finland doing her PhD on the slave-making behavior of one ant species on another. Colonies like this, she'd watch for a, an ant to leave, and then she'd follow it, and, and it would intentionally go to a different species anthill, snag an individual and bring it back and turn it into a slave for the home colony. And while she was doing that, she discovered that virtually every anthill in Elk Island is established on the bison patty. And the queens use it as that nutrient base to get the colony started. And that's really important for northern flickers. These guys love to create their nesting cavities adjacent to the forest edge. Uh, they love to eat uh, ground insects, in particular ants. Uh, they'll bring that back and, and feed it to their chicks. And that in turn is really important for the northern flying squirrel. It turns out that the flicker cavity size is the perfect Goldilocks cavity for flying squirrels. Of course, pileated cavities are too large. You know, downy or hairy woodpecker cavities are too small. You know, but the northern flicker is, is a perfect size. For flicker, I mean, flying squirrels are fussy animals. They don't just pick one cavity and then use it for all purposes. They have some that they use just as a refugia. If they see a goshawk flying through, they'll go to that spot where they know they can be safe. They have others that they use just for rearing their young you know, natal ca cavities, and they have others that they use just for their climate. And over time, some of those cavities will develop upwards of a meter deep flying squirrel dung, which is really important for this guy. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of that dung beetle, but it lives on flying squirrel dung. And if you didn't have that sequence of events leading to squirrel dung in that cavity, the ecosystem necessary for the survival of this dung beetle wouldn't be there. So tremendously important to have bison back on the landscape and provide those levels of ecosystem services. Oh, I've got a duplicate slide here. Just skip by that. Which leads me to this study. A really fascinating analogy of ecosystems and, and airplanes. Where these guys postulated that, uh, used the analogy that you can have some idiot crawling around inside a DC-3 like this one, uh, pulling out components. These are very complicated ecosystems within an airplane. And there's literally hundreds of different parts that make that thing fly. But as that idiot crawls around and, and follows with the airplane, yanking parts out, the plane can still fly and function. But if essentially, eventually, he pulls out one piece that the plane can no longer function, and it crashes. Uh, this is a plane locally known as Miss Piggy, just outside the airport in Churchill. And she crashed not because some idiot pulled out an essential component, but because the airplane was overloaded. And ecosystems collapse either because we pull out a, a keystone species or because we overload that ecosystem with just too much of our, our human use. Um, and it turns out that you can reverse that that concept. Miss Piggy's she's gone. You can't get her back in the air. But if you put bison back on the landscape, all the other species that she, they share space and time with can become more abundant on the landscape. So when you think back to this complex map showing uh, the ecosystems of North America, and we only looked at the region just east of you know, Cypress Hills and Grass Islands National Park. The incredible diversity of life that bison interacted with is just mind blowing to me. Um, so I know I rushed through that because we were short of time. Um, but this is our book, The Ecological Buffalo, um, which just came out this past summer. And this presentation is a very brief glimpse into the contents of this book. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, everyone. As a reminder, if you're not on the mailing list to receive invites to our science seminars and would like to be added to, to it, or if you and your team has work that you would like to share in an upcoming science seminar, please contact the OCS at aep.ocs at gov.ab.ca.